Hi everyone, uh, my name's Craig, I'm the Technical Manager uh, for QNAP UK. Um, today is part two of our four-part webinar series, which is entitled Managing Your Storage. Um, the first session was on June 11th, um, and we did record that session, so anybody that wants to catch up on that, um, you can go um, catch that on our YouTube channel. Um, the things covered in that session were things like the initial setup wizard, so setting up the QNAP straight like it's a new one out of the box, uh, creating a storage pool and the RAID to go with it, uh, showing you the different types of volumes and creating a volume, um, and we also went through some permissions options, so the users, the groups, uh, how to set up domain controllers, things like that. Um, so if anybody does want to catch that, just have a, have a search for our YouTube channel. Um, parts 3 and 4 will be coming up on July 9th and July 23rd, so make sure you've signed up for those if you want to join us on those ones as well. Um, so we'll get straight into this one and we'll go through the different options that we've got in this one. So this session is going to cover off um, snapshots first of all. Um, then we're going to go through SSD caching um, and creating a, an SSD cache. Uh, we've also got Q-tiering to go through on this one, so we're going to show you our Q-tier feature. And we'll also show you uh, a quick demo on how to use um, iSCSI um, on your QNAP NAS if you are a business user and want to go through those features. So we'll, we'll talk about all of those. So we're going to jump straight into the first part here, which is going to be covering off the snapshots and what they are. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a little summary of the uh, the NAS I'm demoing with today. Um, so if you do have a QNAP and this looks a little different, it might be explained by some of the options on this particular unit. Um, so the NAS I'm using here is a TVS-882. Um, I've got five drives configured inside this unit, and the uh, drives of choice today are some 12 terabyte um, Seagate IronWolf Pro. I've got five of those inserted in this NAS, and um, I've got them configured in a RAID 10 with a hot spare. So I've got the, uh, the, the five discs showing there. Um, in this NAS, I also have a PCI Express card inserted, which is one of our QM2 adapters. Our QM2 cards come in many different flavors. Uh, the one I'm using today has four M.2 NVMe slots on it, um, and I've got uh, four um, M.2 NVMe um, uh, SSDs on there right now. So I've got four um, of the 480 gig, the new uh, the new ones from Seagate, the Ironwolf 510s. Um, I've got a couple used straight off the bat. Um, so these are used in our Q-tiering, which I'll get to in the demo a bit later on. Um, but I've also got two spare ones at the bottom there, which I'll use for the SSD cache demo uh, when we get to it as well. So if we go straight on to the uh, first part of the, the webinar, which is snapshots, I've got a lot of different um, volumes created on this NAS. Um, only one of them right now has snapshots enabled, so we'll cover that one a bit later. First, I'll, I'll go through a bit what you would use a snapshot for. Um, so a snapshot is all about getting um, more restore points throughout your day. So if there was a, a mistake made by a user, um, something catastrophic happened, like maybe you were infected with malware or ransomware, um, Snapshots are absolutely brilliant at covering you in those situations. So snapshots are stored on the NAS in a read-only manner. Even the admin user with the admin password cannot change what is in a snapshot. All they can do is um, delete them. Um, so the, the integrity of them is very high. Um, so nobody can go in and, and change what's in a snapshot. Once a snapshot is made, it is fixed. So even if something like ransomware or malware um, was to take over your data, your devices on your network, anything like that, um, they will not be able to affect the snapshot data stored on your NAS. So that data is always safe. So every volume that you've got uh, with a snapshot protection on it is going to cover you against um, any data loss uh, in those in those situations. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I've got a volume at the very top there, which is called archive, and I'm going to actually set up a snapshot on this volume and I'm going to go through the schedule options that you've got within there. Um, so when you create a volume on the on the QNAP you do get a few choices for the uh, different options. So I did cover this a little bit in the first session a couple of weeks ago. Um, the first option that is always auto selected is the thick volume option. So both the thick volume and the one to the right, the thin volume, both of those support snapshots and we highlight that here um, underneath the volume selections. If you were to ever choose a static volume, um, you cannot use snapshots on those. So I would always recommend using a thick or a thin volume 
Um, snapshots is very, absolutely invaluable. It's one of the best features for safeguarding your data on the NAS from the most common things that lose data, perhaps a user mistake, um, something was deleted by accident, things like that. Snapshots are fantastic at covering those situations. So here I've got the, the, the different options in the volume. So, so long as you're using a thick or a thin, we can go ahead and do the snapshot options. And as you can see, the archive volume that I've got here um, is a thick volume. So that's one that supports snapshots. So to enable snapshots, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to go to the snapshot manager for that volume. So it's going to open it up. It's going to give me a little wizard, a little bit of information about what exactly is a snapshot and what you can do with the snapshot manager. Um, so the main point here is to create multiple restore points um, for a volume. So you get very fast restore times. Um, and we can also reserve some space to guarantee that the NAS always has space for your snapshots. So we'll close out of that and we'll look at the main screen. So right now we haven't done a snapshot in this volume, so it's pretty empty in here. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at the top. It says here, pool guaranteed snapshot space. So within the storage pool, which is where the volumes sit within, so that's what we can see in the background there. Within that, I have allocated 20% of the total pool space to be allocated as guaranteed snapshot space. So when we click configure on that option, you can see I've got that enabled and I've got the percentage set up at 20%. So you can set a custom amount if you wish, so you could change it to a certain amount of gigabytes if you didn't want to use one of the percentage options. Um, I did just use the recommended option and I put it up to 20% for some extra protection. So what that's immediately going to do is it's going to reserve some space straight out of the storage pool that cannot ever be used by a volume. It's there purely for the protection of data on the NAS. So that's what I've got enabled there. Um, so if I go into the archive snapshot manager here and go to schedule a snapshot, there is a lot of options here that let you pick and choose exactly how you want the snapshots to protect your data. So when you click the enable schedule option, you get some options here and there's a lot of customization you can do on how many snapshots you do. You can have one snapshot a day at 1 a.m. or any other time of your choice. You can also repeat a certain schedule. So you could say, do I want a snapshot every three hours throughout the day or every three minutes? You know, you can set it up to um, any schedule that you like. Um, so I would normally do something like an hourly one. I would set it to go every hour throughout the day um, because it's going to give me a lot of restore points. So if somebody was to accidentally delete a file, overwrite a file, something like that, um, the worst, that, the worst case is if I was to restore one of my snapshots to recover my data, the worst I would be out is an hour's worth of data. So if you, if you set it to a very high frequency, it will use a little performance from your NAS to do that, um, but it is going to give you a lot of restore points that you can go back to. If you set it to only happen once a day and somebody makes a mistake um, on some data on the NAS at 5 p.m. and you set them to go at 1 a.m. let's say, you would lose that whole day's worth of work if you were to restore the whole snapshot. You can obviously just restore um, one particular file if you needed to, but if you wanted to set lots of snapshots throughout the day, it's going to give you a lot more recovery options to get your data back. You've also got options for the snapshot retention pol policy. So if I was to click this, it goes to the next tab of the snapshot retention and you can keep them for a certain period. So you can keep them for one week, one month, you can set it to however you want to. So you could say, I want to keep them for a whole year if you wanted to, so keep it for 12 months. And what I generally recommend is the smart versioning option. So when you select smart versioning, um, for anybody familiar with Apple Macs, this works very much like um, Time Machine does um, on your Apple Mac if you ever do backups with that. So smart version lets you keep, keep a certain number of snapshots. So you can say for the last several hours, I want to keep 24 snapshots for the last hour. Um, for the daily snapshots, maybe you only want to keep one a day, uh, seven a day, sorry. Uh, for weekly snapshots, maybe you want to keep two weeks. Um, and for the monthly snapshots, you want to keep two months. So you can be very specific with the smart versioning. So it's a lot more uh, granular in the control here. You don't have to sit to a rigid schedule. This is a lot more flexible and it will start deleting multiple snapshots to free up some space in that guaranteed snapshot space so that you can get that space back. Um, so if we were to go through and set up a snapshot schedule on this one, so I'll keep these smart versioning um, options I've got here. I'm going to set a, a repeat option. I'm going to say every three hours I would like um, a snapshot done. And we've also got a smart snapshot feature down here as well, where this will actually only take a snapshot if data has been read or written or modified on the volume. 
Um, it will not take a snapshot just because your schedule says so. Um, each time a snapshot is taken, the NAS performance will decrease a tiny amount, um, but this will reduce the number of snapshots you're storing on the NAS. Um, the reason it, it can be important to reduce the number is each NAS um, can only store a certain number of snapshots. So each NAS has this option up here that says, how many snapshots can I have? When you click that, it will tell you the exact amount this particular NAS can have. So it is quite a high number. So this NAS supports 1,024 total snapshots with a limit of 256 snapshots per volume. Um, so each, each NAS will have a, a, a different number here. So if you were to go with a lower cost NAS, the number is quite low. Um, for the high end NAS, this is pretty much the maximum number that you can expect to see. And if you use smart versioning, it really keeps those number of snapshots in check. Because if you were to do one snapshot a day um, uh, for a month, you'd definitely be over the limit. Uh, so Sorry, one snapshot an hour and um, keep them each for a month, you would definitely go over the uh, 256 limit pretty quickly. And um, so it wouldn't actually be able to meet your schedule. Whereas if you do smart versioning, it's going to make sure that it starts deleting lots of the granular level um, restore points uh, for say two weeks ago. It's not going to keep those. Um, and in all likelihood, you may not restore data back that far. It would be too much to lose, um, but that's how you would do it. So here in the schedule snapshots, I'm going to click OK, and I've set up that snapshot. So that's going to say here, it's going to um, apply the new snapshot policy, I'm going to click OK, and this successfully enabled snapshots on that volume. So there's no volume going to take place just yet. It's going to take place the first one in three hours. But what I can do now is I can immediately take a snapshot of that data. So here it's just giving you a, an option that the volume speed will drop a slight amount when you enable snapshotting. If you click OK, ask you to name the snapshot and you can choose to keep the snapshots permanently as well. So I'm going to click OK and that's now going to protect that two terabyte volume um, with a snapshot. So now the screen looks quite different. We've now got the snapshots uh, stored here. I've only got the one. What I'll do to demo this screen really is I'll go check another volume where I've got lots of snapshots. So a quick way to get to the snapshot manager is just click the little camera icon that's there. So I've got a number 20 there, which means I've got 20 snapshots. So when you click that, it's going to open up the snapshot manager for that volume. And we can see here I've got several snapshots taken from today and I've got some from yesterday when I enabled the feature. So here, if I go through the different options, you can go back to any point in time and then you can drill down into the uh, snapshot to go see any data that you may have. Um, so it's a really easy way to go through and you've got different options at the bottom where you can restore the volume snapshot. You can restore just a file to its original location or you can restore a file to another location. So if you if you had somebody that made a mistake on, say, an Excel spreadsheet, um, instead of restoring the file and overwriting it, um, you may want to restore the file to a different location so that you can open both files at the same time and compare what was wrong between them. So it's really easy for you to go through and, uh, and manage the snapshot information. And for anybody that's using Windows, um, by enabling snapshots on a volume, any shared folders within that volume, the users are able to interact with that data themselves. So you as the admin of the NAS would not have to come in here and go and restore the files for them. Uh, they wouldn't have to log into the QNAP web interface to restore the files either. They would simply be able to right click on the folder um, that had the deleted item in it from within their own Windows environment, perhaps their map network drive. If they go to the properties option at the bottom, they will see that in the window there, there is a tab called previous versions. And this is going to allow them to effectively have a view a bit like this snapshot manager, but natively within Windows. So they're able to go back and restore versions of files themselves simply by copying and pasting or, or clicking the options within that screen uh, to put that data back to where they want to or copy it to another location. So it's a really good option for anybody wanting to use um, uh, snapshots. It's, really, it's a really good way to back up your data. Um, now, the one drawback of a snapshot is that all the data is actually stored within the NAS. So you can't technically call it a backup because it's not putting the data elsewhere. It's just giving you more recovery points. So we do have an option down here called snapshot replica. So I've got a sad face because I've got no protection effectively um, on my uh, snapshots that I've got here because I'm not sending them to anything else. So it says here protected by snapshot replica is zero. So Snapshot Replica would allow you to create a replication job that's going to send the data 
from this NAS to another QNAP NAS. So if you've got two QNAPs, you can have one as the backup target for all the snapshots. So it gives you basic options, which, which volume do you want to back up? So I could do the live data volume. It's showing me here that I've got 20 snapshots for that. Uh, I can click next and it's going to want the information of another NAS that I've got on the network. Um, you can type the information if you know it, or you can detect that NAS and send it across. Um, you've also got a local host option, so perhaps you had two separate raids within your NAS. You are able to send it to a different NAS, uh, a different volume within your own NAS, or a different storage pool within your own NAS as well, if you just want protection against the raid pool failing. Um, so here it's come off and found a couple of different NAS that I've got powered on here, so I could just select those NAS, I can pick it, I can type in the password for that NAS, and I could send my uh, snapshots over to that NAS so that I actually have a true backup of the data. My, my data is now both on the local NAS as well as the remote NAS. So that's an option that you can do within there. And if you are using it, if, if this NAS was, for example, the destination for another NAS's snapshots, uh, you do have a snapshot vault there. Um, this one is not configured that way, but in the snapshot vault, you would see um, all the options for the snapshots that had been stored on this NAS from a remote NAS. So this is how you would manage them. If that NAS was to ever go down or something like that, you, you effectively have your own snapshot manager here and you could mount those snapshots on this NAS so that you're back up and running as quick as possible. You wouldn't have to restore the data anywhere. You can just simply mount the volume uh, uh, that, that was snapshotted and then you're able to let the users have access to that data again. Um, so that's snapshots, and that's the, the, the bulk of what I wanted to cover there. If anybody has any questions, um, please just ask them there. We've got the chat section and the answers section within the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, a couple of my colleagues are on there uh, looking at the questions um, uh, live during the session, so they'll be able to answer them for you. Um, if there's anything they can't answer, um, I'll try and cover them um, uh, after the session ends. I'll, uh, I'll have a read of them, I'll output the report, and I'll, I'll get back to you on those as well. Okay, so the next thing I want to cover is our SSD cache feature. So here within the storage and snapshots, we have a cache acceleration tab down here. As you can see, I don't have an SSD cache enabled now. It's really easy and really fast to enable an SSD cache. Um, so of course you would need at least one um, SSD inserted into your NAS that is not used. So if I go back to the disks panel here, we can see that I do have two which have purple squares next to them, which is telling me that they are free. They're not being used by anything right now. And we can see they are the uh, Ironwolf 510 480 gigabytes. Um, so here, if I click back to the cache acceleration, there's a big blue plus button. If I click that, it's going to start up our wizard. Uh, the wizard is a really easy way for you to find out which is the best mode, best option for you. Um, so if I was to click next here and scroll down in this list, it's going to show that I've got two SSDs um, that are available so that I can tick those. So I'm going to put both of those in an SSD cache. So by default, it's giving you a cache type of read-only. If you click the information button, it's going to just give you some extra info. Now for most data, most users are going to want to enable a read and write cache because they're sending data both ways. They're gonna be writing data to the NAS and they're gonna be pulling data back from it as well. So if you select a read and write cache, it's going to automatically pick a RAID mode for you. Um, as I have two drives, it's picked a redundant RAID mode of RAID 1. You can forcibly select RAID 0 if you want to. Um, but again, if one of the drives fails, um, the SSD cache is going to be disabled and there is potential for losing some data if you do that. Um, so I would recommend sticking with a redundant RAID mode, especially when using a read-write cache or a write-only cache. In both instances, I would recommend doing um, at least a RAID 1. Um, so here I'm going to click next. Now it's giving me the option for SSD over provisioning. I won't go into too much detail on that, but effectively the um, the more data an SSD has on it closer to its upper limit, um, the slower they can perform. Um, different SSDs work differently in this, so we do have an SSD profiling tool that will go off and test the disk. It does take a little while to run. Um, but the SSD profiling tool will fill the SSD up to different levels of capacity and run performance tests on it. So it's going to go through and uh, uh, tell you what would be the best over-provisioning option for you. And we do support over-provisioning all the way up to, say, 60% if you wanted to. Um, obviously, it does minimize the amount of data in your SSD cache, but it keeps it running at optimal speeds. So um, the side benefit is, yes, your cache is smaller, but it's going to be a much faster cache. Um, so you can set it to whatever level you want. I'll set it to 20% for this. 
Um, you get different options here for what exactly is going to be accelerated by the SSD cache. Um, so the default option here is the random I.O. Um, so this is going to be recommended um, for mainly business applications, things that are going to be using um, very small packet sizes, things like that. So good examples there is the virtualization and database applications. Um, all I.O. is really good for everybody else. So anybody doing you know, media streaming, file serving, you know, office documents, things like that, um, all I.O. will accelerate everything it possibly can um, on the NAS. So if I select all I.O., and there is an advanced settings box here that lets you change some other settings. I personally would generally not recommend using first in, first out. Uh, least recently used is the most efficient way to run um, uh, the SSD cache. So with first in, first out, if a piece of data um, was copied into the SSD cache, say, two weeks ago, now the SSD cache is full, even if that piece of data is still being accessed all the time, when the SSD cache is full, it's going to kick that piece of data out because it was the first in. And it's kind of wasteful because if you're still accessing it on a daily basis, it's just going to be brought straight back into the SSD anyway. So it's kind of repeating a task it didn't need to do. Whereas least recently used is exactly that. The piece of data that was used the least that's in the SSD cache when it fills up is the first thing that's going to leave when some new data needs to come in. It's much more efficient and it's the option that we have selected as standard. So the, uh, the acronym for that would be the LRU mode. So we're going to leave that one selected. We're going to click next and now it's going to let me select which volumes on my NAS am I going to use the SSD cache for. So for in most circumstances, so a couple of examples I've got set up here is say the archive. So that's data that you may not be accessing that frequently anyway. I don't want to use my SSD cache capacity to accelerate a volume that may very rarely get accessed by anybody. And also the surveillance data. Um, because the surveillance data is pretty much being recorded 24-7 from multiple cameras. Um, the surveillance data will very quickly fill up the SSD cache, um, and it doesn't really need to be. Cameras generally only have a 100 megasecond um, connection. They usually don't even have gigabit on them, even for a very high quality video feed. It still works just fine over 100 meg. So there's really no need to be accelerating data for the surveillance, unless that's all you use your NAS for. If that's all you're using your NAS for, by all means, use the SSD cache on that. Um, so for things like the system data, live data everybody's accessing, virtual machines they may host, or iSCSI volumes, you can leave all those selected. Don't worry if you don't know what you need to accelerate here. You can change this at any time very easily, and I'll show you how to do that as well. So I'm going to create that. It gives you a warning that anything on those SSDs you've selected is going to be erased. You have to click you understand and click OK. So that's going to quickly set up a small RAID 1 on those two SSDs that I've got set. And then it's going to enable the SSD cache feature. Um, so at the top, it's just going to refresh itself up to the all I.O. option soon. Um, so it's going to tell me I've got a read write cache for all I.O. And if I was to look down here in the cache storage, we can see the volumes that I did accelerate. And um, this is reflected in other screens as well. So if I was to go look at my storage and snapshots, we can see we've now got this nice lightning bolt next to the volumes that I selected. So that's letting me know that those volumes are now accelerated by an SSD cache. So over time of you accessing data um, on those volumes, so when you do different things on the NAS, you'll start seeing this hit rate start go to go up on the NAS. So if I was to do something on this NAS, for example, if I was to open up our virtualization station application, I won't cover this in too much detail because it's a, a feature we'll cover on another session. But if I was to start up um, a virtual machine or two here on the NAS, that's going to start um, booting up these virtual machines in the background and we should start seeing the hit rate go up. So we can see that immediately there's a massive jump just happened. Um, so that's now working to accelerate um, the performance of what's happening on one of the volumes that is being cache accelerated um, uh, within this NAS. So it's a, a really good way for you to see if you set up your SSD cache in an optimal way. If you have this sat down here at 0% all the time, um, you would normally get that in the random I.O. option and you've maybe not set the threshold for the type of data you're using. But if you see your SSD cache set at zero, you've basically paid and set up a feature in your NAS um, that's monitoring for data that you don't use. So you're not getting any acceleration from it. So you do want the hit rate to be up quite high. So you're getting the best bang for your buck out of the, uh, the more expensive items that you bought there, the SSDs, for example.
Uh, so just to um, give you an example of the performance boost that you can get from an SSD cache, I'm just going to switch back to the slides. Um, the reason that I don't do um, the tests during the session is each of these tests um, actually takes about 35 minutes to run. Um, so obviously not very friendly for a webinar. Um, but here is a, a, a set of benchmarks that I did just yesterday. Um, so we can see in the data types, on the left, we have the SSD cache disabled. On the right, we have it enabled. Now with the measurement on the left, the top line on both sides actually is the sequential transfer with a large packet size. So a one meg packet size, um, so that it's showing you the performance difference. Now for large data, Hard drives are actually pretty okay at that type of data. Their performance is absolutely adequate for large files transferring in. So big copies of data, that would be things like a backup task, uh, a large move of data. Hard drives are pretty okay. So you can see I pretty much maxed out um, the one gig LAN port that I've got on my laptop doing those two tests. Um, so I was able to get um, basically up to 100 IOPS on the read and write near enough with both tests. It was a very similar test. Now, when you look at the option below and we see the random 4K test, so this is 4K packet sizes. These are really tiny. Um, this is a lot of stop starts that happens, which hard drives are really not very good at. Um, it's a bit like trying to find a song on a cassette tape. You know, you fast forward, find it, try and find it, fast forward again, press play. Have we got it yet? It, there's a lot of stopping and starting and hard drives are not as good at doing that type of data um, as SSDs would be. So here we've got... Um, a massive performance boost increase on the right. So instead of 166 IOPS, um, which is inputs and outputs a second, um, so 166 for the hard drives, we got 1,672 for the SSDs. So it's a huge increase in the performance that you can get um, by using that setup. So it's a very good um, uh, uh, representation of the actual boost that you get. So to give you a uh, an example of the comparison between the disks. Um, here's the two types of drives we've got. So you can see on the left, we've got some IronWolf Pro 12 terabytes. Um, very good drive, CMR technology, um, very fast for a hard drive as well, up to 250 megabytes per second. But when you look on the right hand side and you look at these new IronWolf 510 NVMe SSDs, they can do 3,150 megabytes per second. So it's an order of magnitude much higher um, than the uh, the hard drive technology, simply because there are no moving parts. Uh, one of the really cool things about the Iron Wolf series is that you get the uh, rescue service included on the, uh, the the faster option. So if you've got the Iron Wolf Pro or the Iron Wolf SSDs, you get a rescue service included. So if you did have a failure of something and you needed to do some data recovery, they've got it built right into there as well, and you get a five year warranty. If you had the regular Iron Wolf drives, I think it's a three year warranty. And the performance isn't quite as high, and uh, I think the rescue service is actually optional on those. But this is just giving you a, a massive performance boost option between these two uh, two drives there. And they also have Iron Wolf health management on the hard drives. It's still coming soon um, to the SSDs. But basically, it's just monitoring a lot of information about the drive health so it can do um, operating conditions. Um, and it will do preventative actions uh, to avoid uh, specific drive damage. Um, and it will also recommend an intervention if um, the, uh, the drive health has been impacted by anything. So if I was to go back to the NAS configuration screen and go have a look at the disks, when I click on the hard drives, you can actually see there's the Seagate IronWolf logo. And we've got the IronWolf health management there showing that it's healthy. So if you click on that, it's going to show you the little report, tells you when it last did a test. And you can also download any logs um, from the past test if you want to go through and analyze it. Um, so you can do an immediate test if you want to. The test is pretty quick. So there we go. It says it's testing the uh, and probing the drive right now. It's already come back and said the drive is healthy. Um, so it's a really good way to make sure that your drives are all nice and healthy. And it's going to take proactive action to make sure um, nothing bad happens to the drive. Um, so something else I want to show you here is if I click into the performance test button here at the top of our storage manager. So within performance test, I ran the uh, speed test results on the drive. So when you select the drives here, you can run performance test. You can do a sequential read test or an IOPS read test. So I did that test on these drives and we can see here the results. Um, now those hard drive results are very fast. Um, so 236 megabytes per second, that's very respectable for a hard drive. 
Um, about 200 IOPS for a hard drive is not bad as well. Um, but when you compare these results to the SSDs, um, it's, it's, it's very hard uh, to not see the benefits uh, with going with an SSD. So just as a reference, this is gigabytes a second on the SSDs, where it's only megabytes per second on the hard drive. Um, so when you see the NAS testing itself, this is the speed the NAS has access to. So the CPU in the NAS has access to the data on those drives. So you're able to get a very rapid connection off. So if you were to use some 10 gigabit per second um, um, connections, for example, um, these SSDs alone are going to be able to provide enough bandwidth for multiple 10 gig, uh, gigabit per second connections um, to work. So gigabit is uh, G with a small b. These measurements are G with a big b. So it's a really massive amount of overhead there uh, that you're getting from your storage pools that you create on those. Um, so it's a really big boost that you can get by using these um, uh, SSDs. And these new um, Ironwolf um, 510s are pretty good for that. Um, so one of the things I next want to cover is our Q-tiering feature. So Q-tiering um, is a bit like SSD caching. Um, a lot of users do think it's uh, you get to pick either SSD caching or Q-tiering, um, which isn't true. You can use both at the same time. In fact, SSD caching really does improve pretty much the one negative that you get with Q-tier. Um, so Q-tier is a... Um, a service, there's a what is Q-tier option that you can click, which takes you to the website for it. So it talks about the different options. But basically, it's tiering for your data. It's where you have multiple tiers of data, so multiple levels of performance. So we support up to three, uh, three levels of performance on the, the pool here. So we've got capacity tier, which would normally be something like SATA hard drives. Um, you would have your high speed tier in the middle which is typically maybe a SATA SSD, perhaps a SAS hard drive, like a 10K or a 15K RPM drive. And you've got your top ultra high speed tier. Now this would be reserved for things like SAS SSDs or NVMEs, like I've got installed in this, uh, in this NAS here. Um, so with the split that I've got here, I'm accelerating certain volumes within my NAS. So if I was to click up here to the tiering on demand option, we can see if I expand all of these options down, we can see that you can get quite granular with the settings. You can choose different levels for different um, volumes that you've got on your NAS, all the way down to the iSCSI volume that I have at the bottom, which we'll cover a bit later on. Um, so here in the list, we've got all the different options. Now, this is tiering is going to monitor the data. It's a scheduled service. So if you compare it to SSD caching, SSD caching is a real-time acceleration of your data, especially if you've got the read and write cache enabled. So as data is coming in and out of the NAS, it's going to be immediately going to the SSDs and being read straight back from the SSDs if that's the type of data you're doing. With tiering, it's more of a schedule service. So it's going to monitor what you did, for example, in the last 24 hours. What was the, uh, the busiest data in the last 24 hours? What's not so busy anymore that was perhaps busy in the 24 hours before that? And it's going to do a move on the data. So we can see here from mine, we can see we've got a move down and a move up number. Um, so my, my ultra high speed tier has moved down 152 gigabytes of data that was previously hot data, so data that was accessed a lot, now is no longer um, accessed that much. So it's been moved out to create some free space in the ultra high speed tier at the top. And we've moved up 81 gigs of new data that is uh, gonna be more beneficial. It's, it's, it's hotter data than the other data um, stored within the capacity tier. So it's moved the data around so that the next time that I access it after one of these tiering schedules has run, it's now going to be much faster than it was before. So it's a really good way to monitor it and we have statistics on it. So over time, if you have this enabled more than a couple of days like I have, um, you would see a lot more useful data here so that you can see exactly how your data flow is going um, and which data is sitting where. Um, so as the schedule runs, so to move that data around, it looks like it took about 20 minutes to do that, or there was 20 minutes of tiering schedule happening on that day for me. Now, that could be um, a lot of times it ran the tiering schedule on mine because I have the automatic data tiering uh, option selected. So within the tiering schedule, when we first launched this feature, you had to do a manually set tiering option. So you could pick at what minutes within the hour it was to run. So you could, you know, one through 59 here. So you can set it to say, I want it to run at 10 minutes past the hour. And I only want it to run while the business is closed. I don't want it to happen while the business is open because running the tiering task does take performance away from the storage pool. 
So you can select that you want it to run on the hours when the business is closed, do all the data move when people have already gone home. Um, but between 9 and 5 p.m., let's say, we don't want um, the tiering to be running. Perhaps at lunch break, you do want it to run. So maybe you want it to run at lunchtime because the access to the system is uh, under a much lower demand. Maybe you want to have a schedule midway through the day. So any work that became hot during the morning's work will now be much faster and moved up to the SSDs for the afternoon work. So it's able to cope um, with the, the changing demands of the storage. Um, so I normally leave it set to the auto data tiering. So the NAS is automatically going to watch for quiet periods. So during the workday, normally there'll be ebbs and flows of how busy um, the storage will get. Um, perhaps there's a coffee break in the morning, um, the lunchtime break that happens. Perhaps there's a an all-hands company meeting where everybody has to go to a meeting and uh, listen to the boss talking and make an announcement, something like that. Now, those times, the NAS is going to see that the demand drops on the storage, and it's going to run a, a tiering schedule at that moment. It's going to run the tiering task to move the data around at the time that's going to have the least amount of impact to the users on the network. Um, now, when I talk about moving the data, it's physically moving the data from one set of drives to another set of drives, but it's not actually moving the path, around, the path of the data around. So if I was to go look in our file station application, for example, um, file station is going to show me um, with the little icons and logos next to them what's accelerated and what's got tiering. So if I was to look at live data, we've got the uh, on-demand tiering option that's listed there. We've got the lightning bolt showing us which ones are cache accelerated. Um, so those virtual machines that I booted up there, the, uh, the Ubuntu and Windows option that they're in my virtual folder, um, there's nowhere here telling me that these are on SSDs or these are on the hard drives. Um, the data doesn't physically move path uh, for the user. So the, you know, this data could be being moved right now um, from the SSDs to the hard drives, for example, um, and it wouldn't impact the user at all. It, they wouldn't see that this is moving. It's not something that they have to keep track of. So when you look at how um, the storage pool is made up, so if I was to go manage the storage pool here, you can see that the tiering option is on the left at the top with the auto tiering tab, and we've got the storage pool option on the right. So if I make this bigger, we can see that this is actually made up of two separate RAID groups and um, putting their capacity together into one large space. So we've got a capacity of 21, nearly 22 terabytes from the hard drives, and we've got a capacity from the SSDs of about 350 gigabytes. Um, so these two bunched together is going to give me my total pool capacity that's a little larger, so 22.15, and the data gets moved automatically between the two. So you don't have to do anything once it's enabled. It is completely automatic. Now, because if you were to set a, a schedule, so like I was showing you in the tiering schedule, if you were to set a schedule, for example, where um, you have it set to go only at the scheduled times um, like we had it before, so... SSD caching is what's going to help you in the periods where you don't have a tiering run. So if there's no tiering schedule running throughout the middle of the day, but you still want the data to be as fast as, as if it was stored on SSDs for that time, well, the first read of any data anybody does from the hard drive layer is going to get accelerated through the SSD cache. Um, so you can have a smaller SSD cache because it just has to really cope with the amount of data that was used within the last... Uh, period between the last time that there was a tiering run on the product. So the next time the tiering runs, um, all the SSD um, uh, cache data that was accelerated because it became hot, people were accessing it, that's automatically going to get moved to the high speed tier within the tiering feature anyway. So it does allow you to have a much smaller SSD cache uh, when using the tiering feature. Um, so that covers off the uh, the queue tiering on the product. Um, so um, Different NAS have different uh, setups with tiering. Um, you generally wouldn't want to be using tiering on a really small NAS because it's, uh, say, on a two-bay NAS, it's hard to get multiple tiers of data if you've just got, say, two drives in there. Um, but um, this, this particular NAS that I'm looking at here is a um, eight-bay NAS. Um, but actually, when you go in and check um, within the disks here, you can see that I've actually got quite a lot um, of disk slots here. So it's showing I've got 14 disk slots. Um, because this NAS does have six main drive bays, it's got two SSD bays, um, and I've also put in our PCIe card, which has four bays on it as well. Um, and there's, there's, there's two M.2s on board as well, so there's a lot of slots that you can get um, on a tower-based NAS. So this is just a, a fairly small tower-based NAS, about 30 centimeters wide. Uh, you can fit a lot of storage and a lot of configuration inside that one. Okay. 
So now I'm going to go through the um, iSCSI and Fiber Channel demo. Um, so within iSCSI and Fiber Channel, um, it used to all be within the main storage um, storage manager, um, but because there's now so many options and so many features, so we've now combined iSCSI with the Fiber Channel offering that we have. So iSCSI and Fiber Channel is, is pretty much set up exactly the same way. So when you create um, a, a, an iSCSI volume or a Fiber Channel volume, it looks very similar. Um, so here we can see I've got a, a test volume created, but I'll create one here during the session. So you get to choose a few different options. Um, iSCSI targets, block-based LUNs, or file-based LUNs. I'll just choose the option at the top, which is generally the most popular. So now it's going to launch a wizard for you to create it. So iSCSI is really good for larger enterprises. It's basically storage just for one machine, um, but it's accessed over the network. Uh, when you mount an iSCSI volume to a Windows machine, it actually looks like an internal drive. Um, but the main benefit here is that you get to format this volume to the native file system of your own operating system. So if you connected it to Windows, you'd format it NTFS. If it was to a Mac, you'd get a HFS plus. Um, so here we can create an iSCSI target profile. So we can create a name for it. So let's call it webinar. Um, you can also have a few advanced settings for different headers and different options. If you know what you're doing with iSCSI, you may need these features. Um, click next. You can also set up authentication. So if you only want people to be able to connect to these volumes with a certain username and password, you can set those up as well. Um, then it's going to create a LUN and map it to this target. So we're going to click apply. So that's now going to go off and create um, um, the, the target in the background. Now we have to assign how much space is going to be available for it. Um, I'm going to assign this to storage pool one. I'm going to create a thick or a thin. So a thick volume is one that gets all the space allocated immediately. Um, a thin provisioning is it only uses the space that is actually stored in the volume. So I'll choose a thin one here. Click next. You can set the size of this to be anything you want. Um, so I'll set just a one terabyte one here. I've got a couple more advanced settings down there as well. So you can choose whether or not you want tiering enabled on this um, volume um, and whether you want it to be accelerated with an SSD cache or not. So I'm gonna click next and then I'm gonna finish. So now it's gonna complete the action. It's gonna go off, create the volume. Um, it's already created the iSCSI target in the background. And with this um, being set up, you can now go off and uh, connect to the volume, uh, mount it. Um, IMAX, uh, Apple Macs and Mac OS can use this um, iSCSI volume as well. Uh, we do have a few people, a few customers that use some um, 3D editing software that will, um, it doesn't work with network map targets, uh, but you can fool it into working with uh, QNAP storage by using an iSCSI volume instead. Um, so you can still get around um, having remote access to the storage uh, without actually having to upgrade the storage inside the Mac by using this. Um, so that's a really easy way to create it. Um, if you are using a Mac, you will need some extra software to, to mount iSCSI volumes. Um, Windows has an iSCSI initiator built straight into it, um, but for, um, for a Mac, you will need something. So the, the one I'd recommend is GlobalSAN. Um, it gets installed directly into your um, system preferences here. So you get to go to the, uh, the QNAP that you want to, you get the target, and then you can select which volume that you want to connect to and you can click connect and it's going to go off and look for the target and connect to it. Um, so now that's showing that I've got it connected. Um, so on a Mac, for example, you know, this is managed directly within the disk utility. So we can see it down here at the bottom and we can see that I've got it formatted for Mac OS um, X and I've got um, the volume here created. So if I was to go down here to the iSCSI test, there's the volume that I've got created, it's storage. Um, mounted pretty much like an internal drive um, it's formatted natively for the Mac I can do anything that I want with it you know you can create folders on it and uh, copy data to it um, it's actually much quicker to transfer data into an iSCSI volume than with a, um, a network shared volume the downside is only one person can access it at a time but if you have a, an application that needs it you can have shared storage and iSCSI storage created all within the same device um, so we can see here that now the um, iSCSI and Fiber Channel Manager here is showing me that I have been connected and it shows who's connected. So that's my laptop's IP address. Um, so you can go through, you can view the connections, you know, maybe you have multiple people connected to different volumes. So you can see as much as you want to from here. Okay, so that's the iSCSI and Fiber Channel options. Um, so that's that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover off today. Um, as we said earlier, the uh, the next session is going to cover off um, apps and services. So we're going to go through our um, Hybrid uh, Sync 3 app, um, Hybrid Backup Sync 3. We're going to cover off uh, QVPN and our QCenter uh, Central Management application. And we may th throw another 
couple of different um, uh, featured applications in there as well. Um, we have our new box uh, box safe um, uh, backup tool as well, so we may talk about that a little bit in that session as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. We'll keep the session open a little bit longer just so that people can get their questions in. Um, thanks a lot for joining us today, and we'll uh, we'll see you in the next one on the uh, the ninth of July. Thanks a lot. Cheers.